Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, climate change protesters from the group Extinction Rebellion have blocked roads leading to an oil refinery in West Wales. The Pembrokeshire site, owned by Valero, is one of the biggest refineries in Europe. Oil tankers have had to drive across nearby fields to reach the plant. Our Home Affairs correspondent Andy Davis is there. Andy. John, it's almost back to normal now, but this was a protest which lasted a good 13 hours. Three roads were blocked, involving around 20 people, some of whom you'll see in this footage had managed, it appears, to get their arms locked into concrete blocks on the road to make it more difficult for the police to remove them. As it was, it was peaceful, good-natured, and the group we were filming just got up and left about an hour ago, only to be intercepted by the police, who informed them that they were going to be reported for alleged willful obstruction of the highway. And behind me, in the distance, you can see the reason they were here. The Pembroke Refinery, one of the largest crude oil refineries in Western Europe, and the target of today's protest by a group of people who said they were affiliated to the climate change protest movement, Extinction Rebellion. It's all part of a wider struggle to firstly get this issue further into the public discourse and get people to really take heed, and also to show that this isn't anything exceptional or anything special. We're, we're just normal people who have had enough. The oil needs to stay in the ground. It's as simple as that. It's black and white. We need to actively step towards a future where we are reducing the oil consumption drastically. So, Andy, how was the refinery itself actually affected? Well, Valero, the owners, insisted that there hadn't been any impact operationally. But as you mentioned in your introduction there, and as these pictures will show, you only have to look at this footage to see the tankers and the other traffic having to use the fields to get access to and fro the refinery to see there was disruption. But, of course, for Extinction Rebellion, this was another eye-catching platform for protest on the eve of much more to come, because tomorrow it will be on an entirely different scale altogether as thousands of demonstrations and walkouts are expected across the world as part of the global climate strike. And we'll have more on that subject on tomorrow night's programme. Andy Davies in Pembrokeshire, thank you very much for joining us. Matt. Thanks, John. Now, Europe's biggest economy, Germany, has promised to phase out coal altogether by 2038 in order to meet climate change commitments. Yet it is expanding one of its biggest open cast mines, which is 48 square kilometres in size. The expansion will demolish five villages in the process. The coal company responsible says it is not destroying, merely resettling. But many local residents say that their lives are about to be ruined and they're refusing to move. Here's our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson. Everything is big about the Gartsweiler open cast coal mine here in Germany, including the conundrum it now presents for Germany itself. This is the country that on the one hand says it wants to close down all its coal-fired power stations to meet its international climate obligations. Yet on the other hand, the Gartsweiler is busy expanding, gobbling up village after village. Now, the German government's always said that is regrettable but necessary in the interests of the German people. But how does that stack up right now in the era of a climate emergency? So it is that to drive into Imerat is to enter a village methodically pulverized to rubble. And they're still at it, obliterating the last of the houses. Bewildered, Hans Fisherman's village went 16 years back, but his wife used to live here and still he comes to wander through the rubble. Versucht hier Krampf vorzustellen, wer da gewohnt hat, neben gewohnt hat, neben gewohnt hat. Aber wenn die Straße leer ist und keine Bäume und Sträucher mehr stehen, man weiß nicht mehr, wer wo, wo gewohnt hat. The Gartsweiler Open Cast Mine, advancing west, it is about to consume five more villages. More than 40 have already disappeared down the years into its abyss. The company agrees 
Germany agrees brown coal or lignite is over to be phased out. But the mining firm told us you can't just stop all this at midnight. We have a phase out and not a breakdown of this industry, which uh, would be harmful not only for the security of supply, but also to uh, the area, to the region. Because, uh, for instance, there are some 10,000 people working for this industry only in the Rhenish Lignite mining area. A phase out. So, next to the bulldozing we saw in Emirat, another ghost village awaits demolition. However, this is Neu Emirat, the new Emirat. The company claims it pays generous compensation, allowing the relocation of entire villages. Even a village church, which replaces this. The old Emirat church last year, the day the bulldozers moved in. There'd been a church here since the 12th century. Go to the mine today and you can see the next church to go. Oh, so schön. Hedwig Drabik has lived next door to Kayenberg's church for decades. Aber wir wehren uns ja noch. Wir protestieren noch gegen Rheinbraun. The congregation can protest, but this church too is marked for destruction. Ganz falsch, es tut mir in der Seele weh, weil da sind ja Generationen hier drin gewesen, die alle denen es schlecht ging oder irgendwie, ne, haben die Zuflucht und haben die die Heiligen angefleht um Hilfe. Also das gibt es, Wunder gibt es. In a place full of the imagery of the miraculous, icons, statues, a place of worship here for over a thousand years. Firstly, let me say, we are not destroying villages, we are resettling villages. No, you are, you are so, destroying the villages. They're being bulldozed. Yes, there, there are, we are constructing, or uh, the municipalities construct uh, new villages, so that you, you, Kayenberg, for instance... You know, instance, you're bulldozing villages. You can't well, avoid that. We, That's a fact. We are, but people are uh, being resettled. They move to another place they have chosen, so Kayenberg old, will be Kajenberg new. People from the villages and across Germany have protested against the energy giant RWE for decades and lost. And we put it to the villagers, Germany still needs coal. Nein, wir müssen braun Kohle in Deutschland gar nicht mehr haben. Also das Schlimme ist eigentlich, dass unsere Politik in den letzten Jahren nichts gemacht hat. Die Politik hat nicht auf erneuerbare Energien gesetzt und wir Menschen hier in den Dörfern sollen das ausbaden und das kann einfach nicht sein. Marita Dresen and her family have lived in Kukum, another threatened village, for generations. She says they're not going quietly. Und meine Mutter sagt wirklich ganz oft zu mir, ähm, sie würde lieber sterben wollen, als hier wegzuziehen. Und äh, das tut schon richtig weh. Also da leidet man schon wirklich richtig drunter. Mittlerweile sind wir recht äh, bekannt geworden. Viele Menschen würden uns auch unterstützen in diesem Kampf und sagen, okay, ich komme mit in dein Haus und helfe dir da zu bleiben und das Haus zu bewahren. Zu beschützen davor, dass es nicht abgerissen wird. RWE insists it's moving from coal to renewables to break our carbon addiction. RWE is going to be uh, one of the biggest operators of uh, renewable energies uh, in the world. This is a development which is due to uh, climate change, which is due also to the necessity to, to reduce our CO2 footprint and to develop into uh, renewables energies who will be the future of energy, definitely. So, do jobs and energy security demand a slow exit from coal with villages as the price? Or should the climate emergency mean an end to all this now? Back in Emirat, the reminders of a village life sacrificed for coal. The destruction, painstaking, meticulous, absolute. Right down to the village graveyard. The bodies disinterred. The dead, like the living, moved out for an industry that is itself dying. Alex Thompson, Channel 4 News, Emirat, Germany.
Drill music and the environment are not the most obvious subjects to discuss together, but now one musician has made it his mission to rap about toxic air. Drill Minister gained popularity last year with his track Political Drillin'. His latest track, Choke, has been released in conjunction with a service that rates air quality at any London address. A warning, this piece contains strong language. I'm telling man the air is toxic, acid rain on the window of the cockpit em Emissions going through the roof but no one in Parliament stops it the, the money for the diesel's toxic, yeah. cock corruption's part of the subject yeah. It's got these MPs twiddling in farms and forgetting their debt for the public yeah. and all the Drill Minister is spreading the word about the effects of pollution but he's not new to tackling social issues When politicians accused drill artists of glorifying violence in their music we commissioned Drill Minister to throw their words right back at them by putting some of the violent language used by MPs into one of his own drill tracks. I want to rest as she's chopped up in a bag in the freezer. That's political drilling. Counting cheese, blowing on trees, till my party's winning. She's a dead woman walking, caught up by downing. Getting your knees, bitch, she wasn't doing no talking. His latest release coincides with the launch of a website address .pollution.org, which gives an air quality rating for any address in London, highlighting when levels exceed legal limits set by the World Health Organization and what action can be taken. Earlier I spoke to a masked drill minister with Humphrey Mills who helped set up the air quality report website. I began by asking drill minister himself what had led him to focus on pollution. Um, I concentrate on all types of social issues um, this is one that I believe is, is important for our health. And uh, health is wealth, and that is something that I'm trying to promote um, for my community, for the underclasses all across Britain, and just generally for people to have awareness. I think this is something that goes beyond even the political realm that I'm usually in. And this is something politically that everybody has to get involved in. Humphrey Miles, what you're doing is, is interesting because it actually allows individuals within the London area at least, to find out just how polluted their particular patch of London is. But in the end, it really is only going to work if it's nationwide. Yeah, I mean, that's the plan to follow it nationwide. It's not just their patch of London, it's actually their specific address. Um, and it uh, uses data from King's College London, which is the most accurate data available, which is used by DEFRA, City Hall, um, and uh, it gives a annual average reading of nitrogen dioxide, which is a known toxin. Um, and uh, gives a broad picture of the kind of uh, long-term exposure levels that you would expect to receive at a given address in London. People have been targeting verbally climate change, certainly mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. debate and raising mm -hmm. the issue. But in the end, this isn't actually going to stop it, is it? No, this is not going to stop it. Um, just like Humphrey is very, very passionate about this, um, when it's been brought to my attention, um, little Ella Kissa Debra, which was the first victim of um, air pollution and her passing away, it brought it to my attention that the youth and the future is what is at stake right now. The people that's in power or the people that are of, of an older generation, or should we say, they're not going to have to put up with this for too much longer. Why should a four-year-old have to pay the price of what somebody that is maybe 45 or maybe 52 is making wrong decisions right now. I mean, in a sense, you're trying to arm people, mm. both of you, mm. uh, with an awareness as to what's actually happening to them intimately that will drive them to campaign and then eventually work to change yeah, it. That's absolutely right. We're, we're arming people with, with accurate information um, and also giving them the tools to act on how they can change the situation because Air pollution and, you know, climate change, these are problems that are, you know, not insurmountable. I mean, we can, we can do something about this. Um, air pollution is... Uh, there are a number of different things that could be implemented on every different level, from a personal level through to local council, through to national government, mm. um, to drive this problem down. But um, it's just not being dealt with. And, and by raising awareness, by making people or giving people the uh, the information to understand the problem is kind of the first stage of addressing the problem and, and dealing with it. Realistically, I mean, this country is not very active on trying to uh, address climate change. Mm. How do you think people will look back at this video in 50 years' time? I think oh, dear, I wish we'd done more, or it will actually mark a point when people will do more. 
I think it's very much a remarkable point where people will do more, but I think we're going to look back on these times in the, with the same kind of amusement and horror that we, d we look back on times when teachers smoked in classrooms, for example, and doctors on hospital wards. You know, the, the awareness levels of pollution are, are um, relatively low in terms of what it's doing to us personally and our health and to the climate. Um, and uh, it's, it is going to change. We are doing our best to change it. But one of the main problems at the moment is the information environment that we're subjected to is so heavily corporatized and commercialized um, that we're, people are t just told to consume more and think less. And that's what we're trying to do with uh, this campaign is by giving people accurate academic information, we're trying to nudge people in the right direction. And Humphrey, the idea <clears throat> is that you would like estate agents to put a rating per house yeah, on, I mean, on the sales it, literature? Well, in the same way that uh, the EP energy rating system is uh, used and in the same way that crime rates But are... you imagine there'd be houses that would be unsaleable. Uh, I don't think anything is going to be unsaleable. To make it a consideration in the housing market is, um, is, is, is the idea of the campaign. Well, I think um, you, you were telling me about the environment in which you actually live in Woolwich in London. Yeah, and there'd mad, be a lot of unsaleable mad, houses around there if you knew the well, crime rating. Well, I think I think Kensington, Chelsea, and Westminster are probably worst hit. Worst hit. I mean, you just have to look at the look at the data, and, and the, the worst hit areas of London are the Kensington, region. Chelsea, Westminster, Hammersmith, and Fulham, the central boroughs. Uh, where you know house prices are the highest, actually. Which so uh... mm. you have to you have to see it like this: the pe the polluted areas, yeah, that he just said. Um, there's a Costa Coffee there, there's a Sainsbury's there, there's a Asda's. There's all the same things that are in all the poor areas. Who's working in these places throughout the whole day when they're polluted? Who's who's taking in on their lunch breaks all of this polluted oxygen? It's the people from my areas that are working there all day. The people that own those houses, they're out throughout the day. When it gets to nighttime and the pollution le level lowers, those people go in their house. That's when it's all cut, cut fine to live in Chelsea and Kensington. But in the day, it's me working there. It's my, 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 my neighbor that lives next to me working there. So man has to address this now because man's getting affected by this thing.